Hi, everybody. I'm a molecular pathologist by training. Up until six months ago, I was a full-time employee at MGH. Since then, I've moved to a new privately funded biotech institute led by Stu Schreiber at Cambridge called Arena Bioworks. So as a newcomer in biotech, I feel like an outlier in this uh, session, in this day. But having still half a foot in the clinical world, I decided to give a few uh, examples of how I think clinical needs can and have informed our R&D efforts with respect to using uh, nanopore technologies uh, and how that R&D effort has actually benefited, could benefit clinical applications and has benefited our research applications. My recent background and interest is in gene editing and that's what I will touch upon in, that, in a later part of the talk. So to start, I will give two illustrative cases that I saw while on service at uh, DFCI in Brigham on the molecular um, service there a couple of years ago. They were both seen in the same week. Um, the first one is a 57-year-old uh, man who presented with uh, lung lesions, as you can see on the PET scan on the left side, I guess, right side of the screen, um, and a metastatic disease in the brain, as you can see in an MRI on the other side of the screen. So this is a classic presentation for uh, metastatic uh, lung cancer. Uh, the pathology was pretty non-discreet, just regular uh, non-small cell lung cancer, which is the most common type of lung cancer you can encounter. Of note, the patient had received outside molecular testing at another institution that showed no alteration in any of the targetable mutations. We usually test for EGFR, BRAF, ALK, and ROS1 because there is approved therapies uh, for uh, these um, uh, changes. Um, in addition to that, the patient elected to do outside molecular testing at the commercial lab, and that showed four variants. Let's focus on the top two. One is an ALK intro-19 rearrangement that was found at a variant allele frequency of 0.04%. That's way below the limit of detection for the assay. Um, and the second variant was also an ALK, in this case an SNV, single nucleotide variant, at a VAF around 50%, which is suggestive of a germline mutation in the patient. So the question was, should this patient get a treatment for ALK, given that uh, very, very infrequent rearrangement that was detected? Well, we received his specimen, we performed heartbeat capture, followed by short rate sequencing um, at the Brigham Clinical Lab. And as part of our pipeline, we uh, look at the SNVs, SV structural variants, and copy number variants, or CNVs. So this is the SV plot that you see on the screen. And uh, by just looking at it, you find that there are 43 reads that we refer to as split reads or chimeric reads, sometimes discordant reads, basically reads that if you look on the right side of the screen on an IGV plot, you'll see this rainbow pattern at the end of the read suggesting that part of the read maps in one location of the genome and another part in another. So that's suggestive of a structural variant. Um, so the next step that we do in this case is to basically take the reads, plot them back to the genome really quickly, um, just to see if the rearrangement could be of uh, clinical significance. So the five prime end of the reads, so to speak, map on ALK, we can see on the top panel on a UCSC genome browser snapshot. The bottom part um, mapped in a long coding RNA sequence, not described, not even expressed necessarily in lung based on GDEX uh, data. So the question was, is this an actual rearrangement in this patient again? Does it make a clinical, does it have any clinical significance? So when we have cases like this, because we're using short reads, and the vast majority of clinical tests use short reads, we have to somehow convince ourselves that what we're seeing might be true. So we depend on inferential uh, data uh, and supportive evidence. So one way to do this is to take a look at the copy number plot and look for imbalances on the genomic locations of the genes that could be implicated in such rearrangements. So this is the plot that corresponds to chromosome 2, where ALK lives. And what you see, um, if you look carefully, is a drop in the green dots uh, at some point within the gene body of ALK. So this is interpreted in our world as a partial deletion of um, ALK, and because the the inflection point is close to that intro-19 uh, that was uh, reported before. This is indirect supportive evidence that the structural variant has occurred um, in ALK. So pathologists like to be very brief. So if you see a report this long, it means that they're very cagey and they want to use a lot of modifiers just to lessen the risk of saying something wrong. So we person I personally signed out or typed up this case with all these modifiers saying that this event is possibly a structural variant with a possibly unknown partner, so a novel uh, fusion uh, that might be involved um, in ALK biology. So um, keep in mind there was another variant in ALK, uh, incidentally, and that was at position 1198. So the crazy part of this case is that um, 
if a patient has a structural variant that involves ALK, that maintains the kinase domain of ALK, ALK uh, intron, exon 20, for example, then they can receive um, targeted therapy that pro uh, prolongs progression-free and overall survival. Prolatinib is one of the latest generation uh, drugs that also penetrate the, the blood-brain barrier, and therefore this patient could benefit from this drug. However, there are already reports that suggest that variants at leucine 1198, not the variants seen in this patient, but other variants, uh, confer resistance to treatment. So the question here was, is this patient intrinsically resistant by his germline mutation to any treatment for ALK? And to answer this, you need to phase the variant with the structural variant, so the single nucleotide variant with the structural variant. Well, good luck, we cannot do this with short read sequencing in the clinical lab, so there was no way for us to comment on the chances that this patient would have uh, in responding to uh, targeted ALK treatment. Second case, same week again, was in this case a 56-year-old woman with a long history of lung cancer, kind of a weird history. Uh, she went through multiple uh, rounds of treatment, she relapsed every single time, but she has lived for a long time already. Um, she received outside testing that was negative for any variants again, and we received her specimen as a, a tertiary or quaternary center. If you look at the same kind of uh, graph that or a table that I showed you before, again, this is the structural variant um, assessment by short read sequencing. We could find five reads uh, mapping to ROS1. And if that five gives you pause, that you can make clinical decisions by just five short reads, I think that's right. We should give you pause. Uh, and more interestingly, those five reads mapped to, di to different breakpoints of ROS1. Again, there's approved treatments for ROS1, so should this patient go on ROS1 treatment based on this short read data? Well, if you look at the alignments in this case, on the again, left side, um, they're not as pretty as before. So in our case, this uh, does not have that very nice rainbow pattern. There's a lot of background signal. And if you do the same exercise and blood those reads uh, back to uh, the genome, you get a whole slew of mapping locations, suggestive of high regions of uh, homozygosity or repetitive DNA sequences that could not uh, allow us to separate where our reads map um, because, they are because of their short length. So even a pathologist in experience so does not have you know, good experience with sequencing data, probably they would sign out this as a negative case, especially in the light of the negative results from an outside laboratory. However, I went through every single one of these uh, mappings to convince myself whether there is any possibility that the ROS1 arrangement could have happened. And to convince my clinical colleagues that this is the case, I had to draw it out. So if you were scared before hearing that five reads can be used to make a clinical decision, or you should be more scared now because my chicken handwriting was used to do that. So, as jokes aside, what seems to have happened is a complex structural variant where we have an intergenic inversion of ROS1 followed by a fusion of ROS1 with SLC34A2, a gene of not much importance in this case. The main thing to keep in mind is that if you do this uh, mental gymnastics, you find out that the ROS1 kinase domain seems to be in the same transcriptional orientation as the upstream fused uh, gene, suggesting that a ROS1 fusion can be expressed and is expressed in this patient. Well, we're not crazy to give a report like this without any additional evidence, but again, in light of short read sequencing, we have to depend on orthogonal or inferential data. Therefore, we confirmed this with FISH for ROS1, confirming that there is indeed a ROS1 rearrangement. So keep in mind, these two patients had received negative data before, negative results before, and in our hands, they received results that qualified them for treatments that probably prolong, that could prolong their uh, survival. So the idea we had, well, the idea that came to our minds always is, would it be nice to have long read sequencing to do this all at once? You can do SVs, you can do CNVs, and you can phase any variants that might be of importance, as was the case in the first uh, clinical case in our hands. Uh, in the absence of validated long read protocols uh, in the clinical lab, we have to depend, as shown here, on orthogonal testing. That takes time, um, that take, costs money to, to the labs, and as shown here, false um, negatives are quite common. And most likely false positives are also common just because of the nature of uh, the kind of data that we're dealing with. Um, so we posited that uh, Oxford nanopore sequencing could be a one-stop solution for cases like this. So you can resolve a complex SV that, like the case number two that I presented. You can phase an SV with an, an SNV with an SV, like in case number one. And you know, to the colleagues who say, okay, there's no good evidence that um, uh, base accuracy is good enough for clinical testing. Well, with KIT-14 chemistry or in R10 flow cell, which usually are not used in clinical labs, you can overcome even that problem all in once. 
And by avoiding all the extra testing, then you also have the layer of cost effectiveness, uh, suggesting that you know, we can do this in addition to or in, uh, by replacing short read sequencing in the long term. Now the caveat here that for the clinical lab, you have to do a targeted panel. Uh, clinical labs cannot afford to do high depth, whole genome or native DNA sequencing. Um, so we usually test about 150 genes at a time, the genes that we care about and specific uh, regions of those genes. So that was the idea that kind of like prompted our R&D. So can we essentially come up with a method that allows us to do a targeted panel by long read sequencing and using high accuracy KIT14 chemistry R10 flow cells? Um, now to convince people to give us money for this, we also tapped into the research world. I told you that I have an interest in gene editing and my interest was in characterizing structural variants in the context of Cas9 um, gene editing. So it has been known for years now that Cas9 cleavage, including products that are approved uh, for Cas9 uh, gene editing therapies, can result in large-scale on-target losses of chromosomal regions, as well as uh, massive rearrangements like chromothripsis. So this is what I picked our interest from the research side. Basically, can we, we're doing a lot of gene editing experiments. We never assess on-target large-scale structural variant uh, byproducts of those edits. Uh, chromothripsis is such an event. It is involved in carcinogenesis. Can we do this? Um, of course, it can be done by short-read sequencing uh, using the, um, uh, Peter Campbell's criteria, but then again, you have inferential data to support your conclusion. And keep in, in mind that we do actually see such kind of profiles in clinical data by short-read sequencing, but again, since we don't have direct evidence, we cannot uh, sign the case out as a chromothripsis case, so we say this profile is suggestive of chromothripsis. Now, if you take the example on the right, you can use just long-read sequencing, target your um, region of sequencing at the site of for the cut, either upstream or downstream, and then sequence the whole um, genetic rearrangement. So we decided to um, focus on the Cas9 targeted enrichment that probably many of you are aware. Um, in brief, using uh, Cas9 RNPs in vitro in a multiplexed fashion, which benefits our panel idea uh, to uh, release free ends, a uh, target of interests in order to uh, make the ends amenable for adapter ligation followed by nanopore sequencing. Um, we use bidirectional uh, two to four uh, guide RNAs on both sides of uh, our RIs to do so. And we had you know, expected a, a good, exp expectedly good experience with the Cas, uh, with the Cas9 um, LSK109 kit uh, that has been published and available. Uh, but then we will try to use the kit 14 uh, R10 flow cells in order to overcome that SNV quality. Uh, we were getting, as many other people probably in the room, uh, relatively poor quality data. So low pore occupancy and low read quality coming mostly from short reads um, in most of our cases. And that was the case ac across multiple experiments. So we decided to embark on a long journey of trying to optimize the protocol so that we can make it uh, work in our hands. Uh, because of restrictions, we cannot disclose the steps that we used, but suffice it to say that we used um, not multiple different uh, optimizations in different steps, in the beginning in isolation and then in combination. Um, so for most, of our, for most of the steps that we try to optimize, like the case in the top and the middle panel, uh, either by a single step modification or dual step modification, we would get the same low quality results as before. But we started showing, seeing after some um, extra modifications, high quality data that was encouraging. And the first uh, positive uh, piece of data was um, this with a minimum number of uh, added or modified steps introduced. So the top panel here shows alignments from the 2021 NBD paper by Winston Timp on the original um, demonstration of Cas9 enrichment for TPM2 on the left and for TP53 on the right. And the bottom panel is our data, so we can get capture. We can capture the whole um, region of interest in both cases, and we were pleased to see that the um, uh, high accuracy base calling, not even super accuracy, for KIT14 chemistry does clean up the picture quite a bit. So we're justified essentially to use the new chemistry um, to uh, clean up a lot of uh, background um, indels and SNVs uh, from uh, sequencing errors. To cut a long story short, um, I'm showing you here the composite of uh, three experiments across nine different loci. Uh, with the exception of one technical dropout on the top right corner, uh, we had uh, high depth, high quality sequencing over the whole regions of interest. It's a squeezed in, so there are several KBs, that's why you can see all these different colors, but the quality was as expected from a KIT14 uh, run. Um, and uh, we basically came up with our own version of a targeted 
Cas9 sequencing protocol using Kit14 and R10. Um, again, inspired by the clinical need for doing this at scale in a multiplexed fashion. I'm hoping that we can also apply it in the setting of, uh, in, in the research setting of detecting SVs um, post Cas9 um, or gene editing experiments. So where does this leave us? Well, to do something like this uh, in a clinical lab is uh, kind of hard just because of resources and trying to convince clinicians that, you know, the technology um, can uh, replace short read sequencing. So I hope that we can expand on this in the biotech setting where resources are a little more abundant and there's a little more appetite for um, research and development. Um, but even more importantly, given our you know, increased resources now, I think our next step for us, which will benefit both our you know, biotech uh, enterprise, but also the clinical world, is to be able to provide at scale, um, very high quality haplotype resolved the novel assembled human genomes. So all the data that I showed you before and every clinical test that you're probably going to get a report from uses the classic sequencing, short reads, se short reads aligned against the reference genome. In the best case scenario, they're using HD38. Quite often, you'll be surprised to hear that they use HD19. So it will be actually uh, quite beneficial, we think, to uh, now using nanopore um, uh, nanopore setups and nanopore analysis, uh, the novel assembly on the fly for every clinical sample that comes through. First of all, of course, as a proof of principle, and then um, do that at scale. So we're gearing up at Arena to do something like this at scale, and we hope that in a couple of years we'll have enough data to show that this is a valid approach. In the long term, we hope that something like this can help us and others um, prioritize our targets by detecting new SVs that have not been detected before, but also stratifying patients like the case I presented before uh, for clinical trial enrollment. So uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, um, people who uh, helped along the way. Um, Keith Junk has been my PI at MG8 in the arena right now, and people who've done the work are on the MG8 side, people who are helping currently with arena projects are on the right-hand side. So thanks for your attention.